Eric Pratt, chair of the Senate Jobs and Economic Development Committee, faced the daunting task of improving Minnesota's economic landscape amid the lingering effects of the pandemic. He joined me this week to talk about his funding and policy package designed to help jumpstart the Minnesota economy. The Senate has passed its Jobs and Economic Development budget bill last week. How challenging was it to craft a budget for the coming biennium with the economic picture still unclear as the pandemic lingers? You know, in some ways it was difficult, but in a lot of ways we know what the economic crisis looks like. Um, we know we're facing record unemployment. We uh, have a, a deficit in the unemployment trust fund, twice of what we saw during the Great Recession. Uh, we know that small businesses, Main Street businesses are hurting. Uh, so we know what the problems are. And, and uh, so we, you know, we, we know how to address them. The problem is, is that the problems keep lingering. You know, we're not, we're not balancing the response to the pandemic. So we continue to uh, put these small businesses at risk. And we're really hoping that we can keep as many of them uh, without plywood in the windows while their doors are locked. Um, the bill creates a small business loan guarantee program. What is the intent and who will be served? Well, the intent is to make sure that we can infuse capital into the business market. Um, you know, whether it's for working capital, inventory, uh, having to make accommodations uh, in order to meet the governor's uh, orders and, and the CDC guidelines. Uh, say for Minneapolis, it could be for partial reconstruction or repairs of a building. Um, the, the uses are wide open and any business that's in desperate need of affordable capital, but is afraid that they can't necessarily get it from a bank on regular terms, our guarantee helps. We did a similar program last spring. Um, we lent out about $10 million uh, with $7 million into the reserve fund. This time we think we can make 250 million available uh, with about 80 million in the reserve. And this time what we've done differently is we've deferred the first payment for the first year. So um, the state will pick up the first year's worth of interest so that these businesses that have been shut down that haven't been gen generating any income uh, can get their cash flow healthy before they're required to make their first loan payment. Workforce training is important, especially as workforce needs are changing. On the Senate floor, you said you don't just want people to have jobs, though. You want them to have careers. How is this possible? Well, a lot of the programs that we invested in have a, a good track record of building careers, whether it's, you know, some of the entrepreneurial loan funds that help people start their own businesses and be successful, whether they're, fun, they're programs that uh, help Minnesotans get second chances uh, because of addiction or mental illness. Um, those are, those are programs to me that as we looked at them have a track record of not just getting somebody a job today, but sets them on a course for a career tomorrow. Uh, Minnesota has already faced a shortage of child care providers for some time, but COVID-19 has made the problem even worse. Parents can't work if their children have nowhere to go. What's included in this bill to help? So, you know, there's, there's child care money in a lot of the bills. We put uh, 3.2 million in. Uh, 200,000 to help a small uh, daycare in rural Minnesota, and then uh, about $3 million for startup grants for childcare. And, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, my neighbor uh, runs a, a family childcare and she's only operating at about 30% capacity with schools being closed with parents working from home. Um, it's, it's difficult and we need to keep these, these small providers open because everything tells us that in the fall, more and more people will be going back to the office. Maybe not all the time, but sometimes, and they're gonna need a place for their children to, uh, to get good quality care uh, while mom and dad are, are trying to bring home a, a decent paycheck. You led passage of one of the toughest wage, left, wage theft laws in the country in 2019. But as with many laws, there were some problems with the initial one. This bill solves some, some of those problems. What are the reforms? You know, shortly after we implemented the wage theft law, I got uh, a lot of contact from, from business owners saying that it was difficult to implement the, the um, we call it the wage theft notification. 
we said that before someone starts, you should give them a letter that tells them how much they're going to make, um, what their hours are, what their benefits are. It sounds real simple. But the way it was implemented and the law had some ambiguity, the Department of Labor actually implemented it in such a way that was very difficult for business owners to comply with. Um, it's better, uh, but there's still more room to go. And so, you know, my goal is to remove the ambiguity in the law because uh, 99% of our employers are good employers. We want to catch the bad actors. We want to catch the people who are, who are stealing wages, but we want to make it easy to comply for those employers that are doing the right thing. Um, there were two other provisions. One was to uh, put a cap on some penalties. Um, we inadvertently removed a cap on penalties. And this I think is the only penalty in state law that doesn't have some sort of maximum uh, on it. Um, and uh, um, so those are, those are the primary changes and I'm hopeful we can get them through because they're really pretty common sense. Also part of the bill are some changes to how COVID-19 and executive orders have impacted businesses. Businesses would be allowed to operate at full capacity as long as they have a COVID-19 preparedness plan and businesses would initially be given a written warning in, for violations instead of fines. Further, the law would change to prevent this governor or a future governor from mandating business restrictions by executive order without the consent of both the House and the Senate. Had this already been law, how would the state look differently right now, do you think? Uh, I think if this had already been law, we would see uh, an economy that's healthier than it is today. Um, we would see a government that is not fighting with itself, but working together. Uh, the governor, in, in my opinion, has over, while the law gave him broad powers, uh, he has at times intentionally bypassed the legislature, even on some things that we could have easily gotten done. I'll give you an example. Uh, he didn't, we last year passed some unemployment insurance uh, changes to allow it uh, to make it easier for people to apply and receive unemployment because they got laid off on very, very short notice. Well, the governor extended those, didn't come to the legislature asking for an extension. He did them by executive order. When we've already proven that we can do something like that and work together. Now, we have a lot of businesses. In fact, uh, even last fall, the governor allowed many businesses to open up even without a COVID preparedness plan. And then in June, restaurants, bars, everybody that had been under restrictions had to have this preparedness plan. It's worked well. Businesses take it very, very seriously. I know that every, every Main Street business in my district does not want to be known as the source of a COVID outbreak. Um, and so this has been a nice balancing where if you have an outbreak, you have a plan that you know exactly what you're going to do. And if you're not the source of an outbreak and you're operating in a very cautious and responsible way, you get to operate your businesses in a way that allows you to um, serve your customers and keep your employees safe. And finally, before we go, under this package, workplace accommodations will be expanded for pregnant and nursing mothers. I think many women, myself included, have memories and stories of those days when you were trying to balance work and new motherhood. How will women be better accommodated? You know, that's a great question. And I wanna thank uh, Senator Julia Coleman for you know, really taking the lead on this issue. Um, what it allows is, is women to um, have extra time to um, express themselves um, during the first year of, you know, after pregnancy. While they're pregnant, it gives them uh, accommodations. We lower uh, the threshold of, of employees in a business. Right now, uh, certain, certain accommodations are only available for companies that have 21 or more employees. We lower that to 15. Um, we put restrictions on how much they could lift, that they have to have accommodations to be able to sit if they need to sit. Um, these are just really common sense things that most employers are doing already, and we thought it was a good, a good chance to put them in the state law and make sure that... Uh, uh, whether you're working in St. Paul or St. Cloud, um, if you're uh, expecting your new mother, uh, you have the same set of criteria that you're working from. 
Senator Eric Pratt, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.